Sadhu Amar Bharati held his arm above his head for over 45 years as an unbelievable act of commitment and devotion to world peace. What's amazing though is this unusual act revealed a truth about hair loss that would go on to explain something scientists and engineers had been puzzling over for decades. Why do we go bald? In this video, I'll explain what really causes hair loss and how Sadhu's case can help us fix baldness at the root cause. Okay, let's get started. If you're struggling with hair loss, chances are the first treatment that was recommended to you was finasteride, usually sold under the brand name Propecia. Finasteride was brought to market in 1992 as a result of research by the Finasteride Research Group funded by Merck, the drug's maker. Its development was inspired by observations of males with a rare genetic mutation. This mutation didn't allow their systems to make the male hormone dihydrotestosterone, or DHT for short. All their other problems notwithstanding, these men never went bald. Finasteride successfully replicated these mutated men's hormonal profiles. When otherwise healthy men with hair loss took it, it reduced their blood DHT levels by 70%. The finasteride research group studies showed that among the studied participants, finasteride was far more effective than the placebo in regrowing hair. The FDA approved the drug and the rest was history. Interestingly, if we read the group's published paper, they never state that DHT is the cause, let alone the only cause of baldness. DHT is only referenced as a, quote, contributing cause of androgenetic alopecia. The group didn't make bolder claims for two good reasons. Firstly, they didn't have a good theory of how DHT might cause hair loss. And more importantly, they realized their results could hardly be considered a cure for hair loss. The original adverts for Popecia claimed that 83% of users would stabilize their hair loss with 66% regrowing some of their hair. Not one of the participants grew back all their hair. And as soon as they stopped treatment, the new hair quickly fell back out. Furthermore, the group only recruited men with hair loss at the vertex or crown area at the back of the head. The studies before and after hair counts were only made in the crown area and the FDA only approved finasteride for hair loss of the crown even though most of its users have frontal hair loss. It was a marketing sleight of hand that the public never really wised up to. Despite its modest results, a third of the century later, finasteride is still the only FDA approved drug for androgenetic alopecia that targets DHT. It's reasonable to expect that if DHT were the real cause of hair loss, pharmaceutical companies would have come up with something better. Something that worked on all types of hair loss, gave better results, and of course was safer. Indeed, while research on a developing successor drug to finasteride has essentially died out, the scientific literature on finasteride has anything but. We've actually witnessed an explosion of publications over the last 15 years. The problem is that almost all of these are for the wrong reasons. I'm referring to the devastating sexual and psychological side effects of the drug. Things have gotten so bad that the FDA and other health regulators have added black box warnings to the label. These are reserved for medications with serious and life-threatening risks. The European Union is now considering a blanket ban of all finasteride and dutasteride containing products. The cited reason is their potential to cause suicidal thoughts, but this is only the tip of the iceberg. A sizable minority of users will experience sexual side effects, typically erectile dysfunction, loss of libido, and gynecomastia. While these will usually go away when stopping the drug, this is not always the case. Some users will experience lifelong problems that are resistant to any treatment. New research also implicates finasteride in dysfunction across a wide range of organs, including the eyes, liver, and kidneys. This is only to be expected from a powerful drug that's supposed to work on the scalp, but actually crushes hormones all over the body. Ironically, while the medical community understands that DHT is not the cause of hair loss and finasteride is not the cure, this understanding is often lost among many members of the hair loss community. Seriously, try posting anything on Reddit or any social media involving a non-DHT treatment and count how many comments dismiss you out of hand. I'll come back to DHT shortly, but first let's zoom out a bit and take a look at the big picture of androgenetic alopecia. Let's start with the actual pattern of the condition, something so conspicuous and fundamental that the condition is actually named after it, the pattern, as in pattern hair loss. We all start off in life with a juvenile hairline, which is low on the forehead and rounded. When we become young men, this gives way to a mature hairline, which sits higher on the forehead with larger temples. As the name suggests, a mature hairline is a normal part of manhood, 
along with things like facial hair and a deeper voice. For those with hair loss, however, the pattern will not stop there. The first sign of pattern hair loss is a further recession of the temples, with the formation of a pointy M shape, the so-called widow's peak. After that, the hairline will continue to recede, and this is often at the same time as the crown in the back of the head starts to also thin. The thinning will also spread to the top part of the head until eventually the balding areas in the front and vertex join up to form one continuous patch. Interestingly, even in the most severe cases of baldness, the hair on the sides and back of the head is spared. It never really fully falls off, staying there for the rest of the person's life. What causes this pattern? Why does hair loss start in specific areas and then spread in predictable ways? The answer involves scalp tension, something that researchers have suspected for a long time, but couldn't prove. But in 2015, we finally got a detailed mathematical model of the chronic tension our scalp experiences as a result of the forces transmitted by adjacent muscles. On the left side of this graph, you can see the tension with lighter areas showing higher tension and darker areas less. On the right hand side, you can observe the typical progression of hair loss, which we just described. The thinning usually starts at the temples, then spreads to the rest of the frontal area and the crown. The last area to generally lose hair is the top of the head that sits between the crown and the front. As you probably noticed, there is a striking link between the level of tension and the propensity to lose hair. The highest tension regions tend to lose hair fast, followed by the areas with moderate, and finally, those with the least tension. Statistically, the chances of this being a coincidence is less than one in 1,000. But how? What is it that links tension in the scalp with hair loss? To begin, it's important to understand that scalp tightness doesn't directly miniaturize the hair follicles. Rather, it appears to trigger a cascade of problems in the tissues surrounding the follicles, the scalp skin. The most immediate of these problems is inflammation. This process, known as mechanotransduction, converts mechanical tension into pro-inflammatory biochemical signals. The same process also triggers the overactivation of a signaling protein called transforming growth factor beta-1, or TGF-beta-1. At the same time TGF-beta-1 is activated, the DHT is also activated in reaction to the inflammation. TGF-beta-1 in tandem with the overactivated DHT then triggers the next step in the process, fibrosis. When we say fibrosis, we refer to an excessive accumulation of extracellular material, most notably collagen. Collagen is essential for providing structural support for cells, including hair follicles. But when it proliferates out of control, it eventually hardens and becomes microscopic scar tissue. This fibrosis can easily be seen under a microscope, often as concentric collagen rings that surround the follicle. As baldness advances, the fibrotic tissue expands and eventually occupies the space of the now miniaturized follicle. Where the follicle once was is now nothing but scar tissue. At that point, the hair loss is more or less irreversible. The fibrosis also contributes to the reduction in blood flow that we see in baldness. Compared to uh, healthy controls, men with pattern hair loss have around two and a half times lower blood flow in their scalp. This impairment is not generalized all over the scalp, but confined to the areas which are balding. The accumulation of fibrosis literally restricts the vessels that supply blood to the scalp. Without sufficient blood supply, hairs won't grow naturally. This is the case not just on our scalp, but all over our body. It is this reduced blood flow that then contributes to the hair follicle miniaturization process. Without sufficient oxygen and other vital nutrients from the blood supply, the follicles gradually shrink until eventually they're replaced altogether by fibrosis. This is similar to what happened in Sadhu's arm. The arm was never designed to be held above the head for long periods of time. As such, the amount of blood flowing through the arm dramatically decreased over the years, leading to a loss of muscle and bone. The same thing happens with each hair follicle. When the dermal papilla receives less blood, that means less oxygen and less nutrition, which is needed to build out the hair shaft. Combine this with the fibrotic tissue literally squeezing the dermal papilla, and you get hair follicle miniaturization, which is the hallmark of male pattern baldness. When it comes to stopping hair loss, blood flow and growth space is critically important. This might also be part of the reason for minoxidil's effectiveness as it partially restores the blood in the head. The problem is that minoxidil's effects only last about an hour. All the while, the chronic tension and associated fibrosis continue to progressively choke off more and more of the follicle supply until, in the end, minoxidil loses its effectiveness. 
It is a similar story with finasteride. Remember how we said that finasteride generally stops hair loss, but without regrowing any significant hair? Now we can make sense of this result. Blocking DHT with finasteride will generally prevent the fibrosis from getting worse, but it is not enough to reverse what has already accumulated. Blocking DHT also does nothing to address the root cause of the problem, the chronic scalp tension. Like minoxidil, Finasteride is a downstreamed treatment that will partially alleviate the symptoms while leaving the root cause untouched. And the root cause, as should be clear by now, is scalp tension. To recap, pattern hair loss typically begins at the temples, forming a widow's peak and eventually progressing to a thinning at the crown. Over time, the entire top part of the head goes bald, while the sides and back remain unaffected. Research suggests that Chronic scalp tension is the driving force behind the pattern. The tension triggers inflammation and activates signaling molecules like TGF-beta-1. It is these signaling molecules, along with inflammation-induced overactivation of DHT, which together lead to fibrosis. This fibrotic tissue restricts blood flow, depriving hair follicles of nutrients they need, eventually causing them to shrink and die. While treatments like minoxidil and finasteride can slow or partially mitigate hair loss by improving blood flow or blood blocking DHT, they don't address the underlying issue, the chronic tension in the scalp. This tension remains the root cause of the cascading effects that ultimately lead to hair loss. <laughs> Building on this idea, researchers have spent the last 15 years testing injections that target the muscles around the scalp in order to relax and relieve the tension. They found that just one or two treatments with this injections can effectively halt hair loss and promote regrowth in many men. The effectiveness of these injections lie in their ability to relax the muscles around the scalp, alleviating chronic tension, lowering inflammation, and fibrosis while restoring blood flow to the area. The major drawback of these injections is the high cost, with each session priced about $500 to $1,000. There is, however, a much more affordable and practical alternative scalp massages. Just as massaging can ease tension or cramped muscles in your arms or legs, it can have the same effects on your muscles around your scalp. This method is entirely free of side effects and the more consistently you practice it, the better results you're likely to see. Here's a straightforward yet highly effective scalp massage routine you can do at home. Firstly, choose a time of day that works best for you and stick to it consistently. Routine is key to forming a lasting habit. Find a quiet place you won't be disturbed. You can massage either standing or seated, but avoid lying down as this may restrict your hand movements. Start with a basic massage. Place both hands on either side of your scalp, gripping firmly. Move your hands in circular motions to create folds in the scalp. Ensure a firm grip to prevent your hands from sliding and pulling on your hair. Avoid dragging your hands across the scalp. After this, try the squeeze or pinch technique. Use your hand to gently pinch the scalp by opposing your thumb with your index or middle finger. Keep your fingers about an inch or two apart. If your scalp feels tight, the technique might be challenging at first, but it will become easier with practice. Hold each pinch for a few seconds, then repeat across the entire scalp. Spend a few minutes on this part of the routine, then switch to the scalp shake. To do this, firmly grasp your scalp with both hands and shake it back and forth vigorously. This helps loosen the scalp and enhance blood circulation. Although your arms may tire initially, regular practice will build endurance. Begin with 30 seconds and gradually increase over time. You can repeat this routine once or twice daily and aim to massage for about 10 minutes daily, making sure each area is treated. Though this routine is simple, it might be a struggle for some. Scalp massages can take a lot from the arms and hands, especially if you're not used to doing them. When you consider that on average, you will require about 30 hours of massaging to see results, yeah, many of you guys will understandably be discouraged. Now, if you'd like to get the benefits of scalp massage but cut through all the hassle, the most effective and at the same time laziest solution is the Groban Pro. By inflating an inner tube device pushes the scalp forward, reducing scalp tension, breaking down the fibrosis, and allowing blood flow back into the scalp. The motion of inflation and deflation stretches out the scalp whilst causing the top to crease together, essentially massaging itself and causing blood flow back into the crown. In just 10 minutes daily of inflation and deflation, you'll be able to feel less tension in your scalp, more movement around the sides, and more sensation in the vertex. If you ever sat on your hand for a few minutes until it went numb, and you'll recognize the sensation of blood starting to flow back into your hand and the numbness going ahead. In our experimentation with the grow band, we found that after only about 10 minutes of use, the scalp skin temperature is noticeably increased as skin becomes flush 
with warm blood. This effect lasts up to about 30 minutes afterwards. While using the grow band, you will also notice your skin creasing in a similar way to massaging with your hands. Using the grow band for 10 minutes a day pinches and massages the entire scalp while also reducing tension and boosting blood flow. The newer version of the grow band is battery operated and fully automated, removing any effort on your part. You simply place it on your head and adjust it to find the right position. Be sure to click the link below and head over to hairguard.com to find out more about the HairGuard Pro. And of course, if you're new to this channel, subscribe for more and I'll see you in the next video.